Okay. Okay, got it. Okay, we're recording. Welcome to the show, uh, the round table at Bridget's Kitchen. Carl, how are you doing today? I'm fine. Wonderful. You probably want to know who I am. Yes, would you like to introduce yourself uh, for the audience uh, that if anybody doesn't already know who you are? I'm uh, Carl Meyer. I'm 85 years old. I have been in the Catholic worker movement for 65 years since the day I met Dorothy Day and went to jail with her and half dozen, uh, uh, 10 other people in New York for refusing to take shelter in compulsory nuclear air raid drills. After 9-11, you know what it would be like to have 20 nuclear weapons, Russian nuclear weapons hit Manhattan where I was working at the time <laughs> in a basement. <laughs> so in the basement of Barnes and Noble as a stock clerk when they had only one store. Uh, so I ran a shelter for homeless men when I graduated from the University of Chicago at the age of uh, 21. I immediately started a little storefront shelter for homeless men from Skid Row, ran that including in a family house with my family for 13 years. And 25 years ago, I came down here to Nashville, Tennessee, where I started a Catholic worker affiliated uh, non-denominational community network called Nashville Greenlands. We've restored, participated in the restoration of 10 vacant houses in a poor, neighborhood of North Nashville, a very depressed and devastated neighborhood. And we have gotten a lot of young organizers into these houses, community organizers, and we share all these houses at very affordable housing cost, which is very important in our big cities. Wonderful. And wonderful. Um, I've been involved in all of the major social justice issues involved with the Catholic Worker Movement, with the War Resisters League, with the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee, uh, with a campaign to end capital punishment in the state of Illinois, where I lived for 40 years in Chicago and had my shelter for homeless men in Chicago. And the year that I did a one-man walk against uh, capital punishment, 1965, from Chicago to the state capitol during Lent, that was the year we abolished capital punishment in Illinois through legislative action. Oh, my God. Uh, you really... Uh, I'm a pacifist. I'm a pacifist. I'm opposed to all killing of other people. I'm particularly scandalized by the killing of Christians by Christians. <laughs> but Christians shouldn't kill other people either. Um, and I don't call myself a Christian anymore. Well, maybe I never did. <laughs> because it, it was more about respecting the teaching of Jesus than calling him Christ. <laughs> would you be willing and, to share about uh, your spirituality, Carl? Would you like to... What's share, that? Would you be willing to share about your personal spirituality and... Uh, and uh, yes. The intersection sure. between that and your... your yes, own, sure. Your work? Where I've come to. I was a convert to Catholicism from a, an agnostic Protestant background when I was 19 years old largely under the influence of the social justice. Uh, I was a Gandhian from the time I was 10 years old, the year that Gandhi was shot in India. And the philosophy and social action program of the Catholic Worker Movement, Peter Marn and Dorothy Day, the founders, is very similar to the ideas and philosophy of Gandhi. It's a global comprehensive idea of how people could live together peacefully on earth 
with respecting one another and ha not harming one another. I've also been a vegetarian since I was age 19 because I don't like to kill animals. I realize that um, killing is inevitable in the bio biological structure of our planet, but I don't want to harden myself to killing animals. Uh, I don't judge other people who do. I don't judge people for killing other people, but I don't want them to do it. <laughs> and I registered as a conscientious objector and had a conscientious objector classification when I turned 18 in 1957, or no, 1955. But under the influence of the radical pacifist anarchist Catholic worker Ammon Hennessy, I repudiated that registration in 1959, tore up my draft cards, sent them back to the draft board, was ordered to report for a physical, refused, which was uh, a felony, a five-year felony at the time. Uh, but if you've ever listened to Alice's Restaurant, uh, uh, the 18-minute song of the Vietnam War of a uh, Arlo Guthrie about how song. he went to the induction center and they turned him down because he had a conviction for littering. I was facing uh, indictment for refusing the military draft between the Korean War and the Vietnam War. I wouldn't have been sent to war at, the point, at that point, 1959, but uh, I went out in 1959 with the Committee for Nonviolent Action, and we did the first uh, protest at an intercontinental ballistic missile silo being built in Meade, Nebraska, near Omaha and Lincoln, between Lincoln and Omaha, the first uh, one of the first of the Atlas intercontinental ballistic missile silos that could deliver nuclear weapons all over the world in about 20 minutes. And uh, uh, A.J. Musty, one of the leaders of uh, nonviolent resistance to World War I and to World War II, was another mentor to me. And he went over the fence at me, Nebraska, and I, climbed, I crawled under the barbed wire. We got six months in prison, suspended, and a year's probation if we wouldn't go back to the base. I went back to the base two days later, and I got six months in federal prison. And it was while I was in federal prison for trespassing that the draft board reclassified me 4F as unsuitable for military service. <laughs> so, uh, so what are the principles of a coherent, uh, radical way of life that really challenges? I've been fired twice for labor organizing. <laughs> I've worked as a warehouse work worker, a book store clerk. I've worked out a day labor when I came back from different projects and was broke. <laughs> and, you know, I've gotten up at 5 a.m., gone to the day labor office, sat there for two or three hours before they might send me out, gone back maybe two or three days in a row before they did send me out, worked eight, eight, or, more, eight or more hours, for the minimum wage, went back in the evening to the day labor office to collect one day's pay. <laughs> so, so our movements, whether it's, I was a friend uh, to a number of people in the IWW office of the Industrial Worker, their newspaper in Chicago. These were IWW people in their 
senior years who had participated in the labor struggles at the beginning of the 20th century of the industrial workers of the world. Yes, and Carl, what year was this that you were meeting them? What, how, how old were they? Well, uh, uh, um, probably I first met the IWW people in the 60s. So uh, the IWW got to start, I think, early in the 20th century. So they maybe were 20 years old when they got involved in it. So by 1960, some of them were 80 years old. They were in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Oh, wow. I believe in one big union. I believe in union solidarity. And my view, the view, our view about the economic order is that our compensation in society is totally upside down. What are the most valuable kinds of work, the most essential kinds of work being done in society? Mm. I'm asking you. Asking me. You know, I think um, the, the work to create food and the work to create shelter are the two most important. And after that, the oh, cottage industries that exactly. to making things like soap and hygiene, um, the collection of water, rain catchment, of course, yeah. is very important. Yes. So food, because we all have to eat or die. Secondly, shelter. A lot of what I do is in, in Nashville is about affordable housing and for all the people that are living in tents in the wintertime. And up in Chicago, when I was providing shelter, and there weren't anywhere near as many homeless people as there are now, because there were a lot more of a safety net back then under the New Deal, under Roosevelt, uh, Truman's Fair Deal, yeah. Johnson's War Against Poverty. Uh, uh, there were a lot more uh, safety net services for unemployed people and disabled people and so on than there are now. But so shelter, we none of us really want to live all our life in a tent, particularly in the wintertime or when it's raining really heavily. We might enjoy camping out in the woods. <laughs> so the people that build shelter. Our teachers, the people who teach our children, our child care workers, mm. our elderly and nursing home helpers. I may need them soon. <laughs> I don't want to be treated. I never want to say I don't want to be treated like a piece of dirt because I treat dirt as well as I can because dirt is very essential. <laughs> <laughs> Without dirt, we don't have food. Without good dirt, we don't have good food. <laughs> but so then our health care workers. Now our health care workers are the people like me that raise 85% of my food organically within 100 feet of my house. <laughs> That's health care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a large part of our health care is also our Medicare work, our medic medical care workers. Medical care and health care, uh, yeah, there's a distinction between them. But I have Medicare, and my Medicare coverage is excellent. But whenever I get excellent medical care coverage without, without paying hardly anything, I always think about the people that don't have any coverage and aren't going to doctors and aren't going to specialists because they don't need it yeah. or, or they can't pay for it. They need it, but they can't pay for it. I could pay for a lot of it, but I don't need very much of it because I've lived a healthful way of life. So 
but we comp uh, the educated people and the smart people throughout all of human history, even in primitive societies, they created ways of letting the less educated people and maybe people not quite so smart or without such a good background was convincing them that they were worth much less because they were more easily replaceable. Mm. Mm. A tomato is more replaceable when you're hungry than a $25 gold piece. Mm. But <laughs> when you're hungry, it's the food that you need. Huh? Yeah. Do you want to be a hot tar roofer? A hot Do you want to get up? It's a, it's a, it's 95 degrees out here in Nashville now. Over a hundred uh, heat factor. Now, do you want to be up on a 45 degree angle pitch roof, tearing off the shingles? and putting down underlayment. I've done it, I'm a carpenter. <laughs> I make a, a pretty decent living as a skilled tradesman. I'm a skilled remodeling carpenter. But I have a University of Chicago education, <laughs> one of our top universities. So can you speak about that and, and how, um how how you did you meet any resistance to become you know to to stay working class all these years um with the with the education meet resistance class? to become working class or to stay working there's not class. a little there's i'm blue collar i could be white collar there's not much resistance to being working class mm. Mm. That's what the IWW was about, huh? Yes, and it still is. And I wonder what what would you recommend? There was for the day there was of today? a lot of there was a lot of resistance among skilled building skilled trades in the nineteenth century, AFL and so on, Samuel Gompers. There was a lot of resistance to becoming a skilled uh, working class person mm -hmm. with skills harder to acquire. And there were ways of preventing people from acquiring those skills in order to create scarcity in those skills. Mm -hmm. There's not a, resist a lot of resistance to becoming a working class person picking tomatoes in South Florida. <laughs> so there's more gravity to, to that than there is to um, perhaps- but The to professional people have done two things. They have organized to keep people out of their skilled vocations and professions by certification and licensing and so on and so forth. They've organized that way, but they've also put their minds to work at propaganda mm. and convince the, our most valuable workers, our most essential workers, that they're, are, they are the least valuable. Mm. Every, every, uh, to Wednesday morning, the Nashville garbage men go down the alley with a truck all day long. Rain, shine, mud, snow, every day. Dumping our trash containers into a big truck noisy after they go through the alley 
the, the stench of rotten garbage hangs over my garden and my yard for maybe an hour. Now, do you want to do that all day for $17 an hour? I don't. I would. I've done difficult work. I've rolled around in crawl spaces. I've opened up sewers. I've plunged I don't know how many toilets. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've cleaned up a lot. I've sanded a lot of drywall, which is my least favorite work in the, with a mask and so on, and sanding or ceiling <laughs> with, with, dry, with plaster dust raining down around you. Oof. I've done that for hours, but it isn't my favorite work. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And I'm, I'm thinking about um, something you mentioned earlier, because you mentioned being blue collar, and there's a verse of a, um, a famous song in the IWW, Solidarity Forever, that was written much later than the original publishing of the song, Solidarity Forever. And the verse goes, uh, they, um, they say our time is over and they say our time is through. They say we need no union if our collar isn't blue. Well, that is just another lie the boss is telling you for the union makes us strong. I wondered, what is your perspective uh, on- I, the, I, the, I haven't heard that verse. Yeah, that's a But I sang that song yes. many, many times at peace rallies and labor and so on in Chicago in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s when I lived there. And it, and it still- In our hands is pop. But trying to convince workers that in our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of armies, uh, magnifold. Mm -hmm. We can build a better order from the, well, I don't believe in the ashes of the old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can you speak I to believe that? in, yeah. I believe in nonviolent revolution and step-by-step -step progress because I don't want to kill the oppressors. I just want to back them into a corner <laughs> where we make them treat people with just, with justly and fairly. And, indeed, and there, there are many ways uh, to go about revolution. Often oh, and by the way, I've been- violence or murder. I've been, I was, I was, pulled by my shirt and thrown on the floor and kicked by a young IWW worker when they had arranged a forum debate between three of us nonviolent anarchists in Chicago, and they believed the violent revolution was necessary, and they wanted a debate about violence versus nonviolence. And when they didn't like, when one of them didn't like what I said in the debate, because we were kind of prevailing rhetorically, uh, he grabbed me, threw me on the floor and started kicking me. Wow. After he was done, I got up and said, are you done now? Are you through now? I've been in many of, I've been, I've been arrested for nonviolent action on peace and social justice and defense of the, of the, uh, constitutional First Amendment and Fourth Amendment freedoms. Mm. And I've won many cases in court. In the first 20 years of my activism, I almost always lost in court and, and went to jail for a certain period of time, was fined and never paid the fines. <laughs> uh, but after the Vietnam War movement, um, you know, we began to have young judges and lawyers who kind of respected what we were doing, particularly in democratic, con in, co in, in uh, cities controlled by democratic parties. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, so that often these judges would respect what 
they were doing and they wouldn't it's, I can't break into a jail anymore. <laughs> Not the same jail system as back then. Have things things changed since the 60s with jails and prisons? Listen, we have won a lot of personal freedoms. We've won a lot of rights in the course of my 65 years of activism. Mm. Mm. I became active during the Senator Joe McCarthy period. One of the guests in my house of hospitality was a Jewish socialist who did a lot of writing about African-American history after Civil War. He was run out of the South where his parents had furniture stores in Montgomery and Birmingham. He was run out of the South by persecution by the FBI, going around to all the places where he lived, all the places where he worked, and asking questions about whether he was a communist or not, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I met him in Chicago. He came to live in my Catholic worker community. He was a good friend, a very good friend of mine for all the years until his death, Eugene Feldman. Eugene Feldman. But yes, he published in the South, he and a colleague published a little mimeographed newsletter called the Southern Newsletter that networked uh, people of European ancestry. I don't call them white. I'm not white. You're not white. I'm European ancestry, huh? Uh, and he networked people of European ancestry in the South who were opposed to racism and racial discrimination. And, uh, and now, as a result of a lot of the work that we did with Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, I knew them, uh, um, uh, uh, Bernard Lafayette, Jesse Jackson was up in Chicago. Uh, both Martin Luther King and Jesse Jackson spoke at rallies of the Chicago Peace Council, of which I was chair for a couple of years, a coalition of all the organizations working against the Vietnam War. Communists, Trotskyists, anarchists, <laughs> Catholics. Catholics were beginning to become involved in the peace movement. Protestant ministers, lawyers, business people, women for peace. We had about 40 organizations in the Chicago Peace Council, all working together under a nonviolent banner to end the war in Vietnam. Martin Luther King spoke at our march in 1967. It was the first time he openly marched against the Vietnam War and gave a speech criticizing the Vietnam War. Uh, and I was marching at his shoulder. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, it's, I have about six minutes left on this Zoom call, and, and we're naming a lot of ancestors here that I want to honor. I have a little cup of coffee to world them into our call here that I'm, I'm leaving here on the table for them. And, and I'm also wanting to acknowledge, and I want to read from the obituary here, of Tom Cornell, who you've mentioned, you know, Tom Cornell, who's a friend of mine, sure. I, I want to write, read this art of this, uh, this paragraph from the, from an obituary on um, NCR online, Tom Cornell, whose actions and writings through more than six decades brought Christian nonviolence and war resistance to the forefront of Catholic life, died peacefully August 1st, that was just two days ago, his two grown children at his bedside and wife, Monica, nearby at the Peter Morin Catholic Worker Farm in Marlboro, New York. He was 88 years old. Could you tell us a little bit about um, Tom Cornell? And I just want to say what is remembered lives here on the Roundtable podcast. We, we respect our- Well, he was, he, he, Tom was active with the Catholic Worker Movement all the years that I was. And for many of the last few years, he was uh, a principal person and his wife, Monica, and now his son, Tom Christopher Cornell, at the Catholic Worker Farm in Marlboro, New York. 
And he is one of the three key founders of the Catholic Peace Fellowship, which was a, a Catholic organization of uh, peace activists and pacifists that became an affiliate of the Na International Fellowship of Reconciliation, which was a, a, a fellowship of uh, religious people opposed to war. It, it, it grew up out of World War I, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And my mentor, one of my mentors, A.J. Musty, was a key figure for many years in the Fellowship of Reconciliation. So that was Tom. So uh, Tom and Jim Forrest and my friend Daniel Berrigan and others with the Catholic Peace Fellowship counseled many, many, many Catholic conscientious objectors during the Vietnam War. During the Korean War and earlier, Catholic, most Catholics were super patriotic and they thought that fighting in your country's wars was your obligation. Uh, and I think your obligation to your country, I, I'm not a patriot. I joined the Catholic work church. I, I'm a member of it by baptism. I don't practice it anymore. I'm a bad Catholic. I'm a heretic. But um, I'm still a member of the church because I make you a member by baptism. You can be a, a bad Catholic, an excommunicated Catholic, or whatever. But I never joined the United States of America. It's a gangster organization that does a lot of good things, but... I wouldn't join it. Yes, yeah, and I, I know Al Capone I noticed... had Al Capone had soup kitchens for the hungry during the depression. <laughs> this is true. And also and, and and I imagine, you know, that when you were talking earlier about some of the social programs, I heard you on the phone talk the other day about some demographics of people you never would have seen coming to your house of hospitality. Um, toward the end of some of those social programs from the New Deal, um, do, would you have ever seen a, like a single mother with with children coming to your house of hospitality, or was it more some other different demographics during that time? They lived upstairs in the five slum apartments up above my five room storefront, but I had a five room storefront with one toilet mm. and one sink living with about nine or ten men in three cots to a room. Wow. And so my shelter was for homeless men. Homeless men. But at that time, because of the social safety net programs, I could take a homeless person down to the Cook County Department of Public Aid on a Friday afternoon. You wait in line, you might have to wait for a time. They would give that person an emergency check for the weekend and an appointment to come back on Monday. And back then, the minimum wage was $1.25 an hour. Mm. I earned the minimum wage as a clerk at Follett's College Bookstore in downtown Chicago. I supported the shelter. I paid the $50 a month rent. I bought food. I, I printed leaflets, <laughs> you know, at, at the copy shop or whatever, on that minimum wage. You could live on the minimum wage then. You could rent a single room occupancy. If you were frugal and didn't waste the money, on alcohol or whatever, well, alcohol, self-medication. But so most of the guests in my shelter at that time were alcoholic men who, when they got a check or got public aid, they went and spent it all. And people who had mental illness seriously enough that they couldn't jump through all the hoops or jump all the hurdles for getting public aid, reporting, and, and, and following through on it. Or they got kicked out by their 
landlords, you know, mentally ill people. But they could come to our shelter, and we knew how to what, how to work. That's with them. incredible, Carl. I we definitely can't do that today with, on minimum wage, and we have less than one minute on the call. Uh, is there any last thought that you want to share with the audience out there today, and um, who are watching and tuning in to the roundtable? Well, in the Catholic Worker Movement and these movements for social justice. Well, as you can tell, it cut us out early, but it was wonderful to have Carl Meyer on the show. I did have a phone call with him afterwards, and he, he said that his closing thoughts, which I wrote down, uh, were that in 65 years, I met fine, courageous, idealistic people I got to work with. I credit that along with good heredity and a helpful diet to my vigor at this age, which of course, um, as you will know, if you read anything about him, he is in his 80s. Keep doing it and one can have a rich life, he said. And then he went on to talk about that, of course, the owning class uh, sometimes has a rich life as well, but that we all know what he means. Um, I think that's a wonderful sentiment uh, to have right here on the inaugural podcast episode, Communion. Stay tuned for more things on the round table at Bridget's Kitchen. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.